Next up, we will be having our lecture by Professor Fraser Stodart, but we need a couple of minutes to set that up, so just give us a minute. I'm just going to take the opportunity to share with you a quick rundown of the rest of the afternoon's program. So after Professor Stodart's lecture, we have with us um, Professor Marku, uh, Dr. Marku Ilaila from the Technology Academy of Finland. He will be giving a short presentation on the Millennium Technology Prize uh, 2022 and 2024. After that, um, I think some of you will have your small group sessions. We have one with Sir Tim Hunt that will be at Think Tank Room 19. Sir Andre Game will be at Think Tank Room number 20. And Professor Hartnett Mitchell will be at Think Tank 21. For our online participants, you will be having yours with Professor Alessio Figali on the Give Me platform. After that, some of you have signed up for the social programs, for the tours that are going um, down to Chinatown, Little India and the rest. Uh, we have more instructions for you later on, but basically, when you're done with the small groups and the afternoon break, if you have time to grab some food, we'll see you at the registration area. There will be ushers there to bring you to your various buses, um, and you'll be going on your tour of Singapore after that. Okay? So, just a couple of minutes more. Professor Fraser Stodart will be giving a lecture today about the recent advances in the design and synthesis of molecular motors and pumps. Now, Professor Stodart is the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry in 2016. And I believe we're almost ready. The Q&A will be moderated by Professor Zhao Yanli thereafter as well. Not on the screen. Yes. Hmm? Let's welcome Professor Stodart. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's great that the GYSS has uh, become live again. Uh, I always looked upon this as one of the highlights of uh, scientific engagement between uh, we older guys and uh, the young people out there. The second point I want to make is um, that, um, believe it or not, there is some major relevance between the talk that you did hear from Professor Werner and what I'm going to talk about. But um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to use a first slide and in 30 seconds cover 30 years. So in 81, we had um, looked at uh, a concept called second sphere coordination. This is a transition metal complex bound by a crown ether. The same crown ether binds a wipeout weed killer called dipod. And <clears throat> The other part of the wide out weak killer that uh, was marketed by ICI in the 1980s uh, is paraquat. And uh, just by shifting some atoms around, we were able to uh, complex paraquat inside a crown ether. This led to uh, the uh, <coughs> emergence of the so called little blue box in 1988, and that set the stage for uh, the first donor acceptor catenane that uh, we reported in Angovatica Me in 1989. In 91, we described a molecular shuttle in JAX, and this was the first time that I actually mentioned the terms molecular machine. Uh, we turned this degenerate system into a non-degenerate system in 94 and made a molecular switch. We put many rings together, again, because there was a lot of uh, questioning about uh, were we actually able to put rings together. So we just said, let's put three, four, five together and the community will perhaps be persuaded. We had a switchable catenane by 98 and I'd already moved from the United Kingdom to um, the United States to UCLA. And we teamed up there with uh, Jeff Zink uh, and put some drug delivery systems together based on these rituxane switches and uh, using same rituxane switches with Jim Heath in the area of molecular electronics. And then there was a big intellectually disruptive uh, discovery made by a postdoc in my group at the time. Uh, and we found that you could take uh, this blue box with its uh, four positive charges that uh, we could take paraquat, or I'll call it methylviologin, uh, four plus two, six charges. You didn't expect to be able to make a complex, but 
If you kill three of these reductively by putting in three electrons, you've got a very strong complex. And so that's now the basis for today's talk because this gives you a huge amount of uh, oomph in making molecular machinery. So pumps through the ages, uh, if we start at the bottom here, our own bodies are replete in examples of microscopic bimolecular pumps and uh, these are three examples along the bottom and they go back of course millennia. Uh, here in the middle, maybe seven, eight thousand years old, are macroscopic pumps including the famous uh, Archimedes uh, pump and then at the very top the, um, the ones I'm going to talk about today namely nanoscopic molecular pumps. And so the first message I want to get across is it's night and day between how these macroscopic pumps work and uh, how both the biomolecular ones and the artificial ones work. So <coughs> if we look at the top of this slide, if we want to move something, it could be a car from here over a mountain to there to here, then uh, that is uh, the mechanical approach. Uh, the landscape doesn't change. If we want to move, make this now say 25 molecules from here to there, then whether it's in the bio world or in the artificial world, it's all about the landscaping and Brownian motion. And that's the first link I have with the mathematician, Professor Vernal that spoke before me. Uh, so we're depending a lot on thermal energy to get from here to there. <coughs> here is uh, a necessary uh, concept in order to be able to make uh, a molecular pump. That is to use a flashing energy ratchet so that you get directional movement across a so-called dumbbell. And this is it defined uh, down here in a chemical context with a ring which is defined there and you can see that uh, under uh, a condition of uh, oxidation the uh, blue rings come on they will go over the neutral end preferably than over the charged one and in so doing they will go into this well and now you change the landscape uh, if you reduce the <coughs> molecules then uh, the well goes up and the mountain in front of it comes down. So again, you heard about uh, adjustable mountains in the last lecture. To summarize this situation on the right, you can see that uh, if we have uh, an oxidative state, we have a binding between the donor and the acceptor here. And when we reduce, we remove that and uh, the ring can move over the right hand side and the energy profile is shown underneath. So again let me emphasize the importance of the introduction of uh, this radical chemistry uh, taking two components with six positive charges, reduce them, put in three electrons and bingo you have a very strong one-to-one -one complex. And uh, here is a thought experiment if we um, reverse our uh, dumbbell through 180 degrees and we have the charge component on the left hand side we can envisage a situation where the uh, reduced ring will form a complex by going over the charge component because it's been reduced and uh, after that uh, we will get relaxation uh, and uh, a lot of Brownian motion is going on here uh, we get to here uh, and then we oxidize the uh, well goes up and the mountain comes down and the molecules, i.e. the rings, move off by the right hand side. So the key factors in the design of these uh, so-called non-equilibrium systems is uh, in our hands at least a highly stabilizing radical-radical interaction between so-called bipy radical cations and these rings as uh, dicationic diaradicals. Um, contrast that with when they are fully oxidized and there's all the charge there, you've got strongly destabilizing columbic repulsions and it is this redox property 
that uh, allows us to go on and design uh, the molecular pumps I'm going to describe to you uh, depending on not thermodynamics but the kinetics of association and dissociation which you can adjust or modulate. So uh, here is the uh, roadmap that I'm going to use. If I have time I'm going to put something in that's quite different because I don't want to come over as just a one trick pony. Uh, we will start then with our first molecular pump, call it Mark 1. And uh, in a cartoon format, here you see it. You see the familiar uh, so-called blue box on the left-hand side and a dumbbell with uh, various uh, species to it. Uh, a charged end at the left, a bipyridinium site for uh, recognition under reduced conditions of the ring. Uh, and what we call a steering barrier or a speed bump uh, before we push the ring onto a collecting chain. And uh, here is a movie, I will define the uh, system chemically in a minute, with the rings coming on under reduction and uh, as you oxidise they go the second one to join the first one. And if we let this replay once again you will notice very interestingly that uh, once you get one ring on to the collecting chain, when you uh, reduce at this point here, it will want to come back. And so the speed bump serves a very, very elegant uh, purpose of preventing that happening. And that allows you to put on multiple rings and that becomes important. Um, and I can go down the um, <coughs> right hand side here showing how reduction, oxidation, Brown in motion under thermal control, um, reduction and oxidation and a more brown in motion under thermal control gets two of these rings onto the collecting chain on the right hand side. So here's the chemical constitution of a system that moves away from equilibrium. Uh, we're just going to use some uh, proton NMR experiment uh, uh, signals. The experiment was done at above room temperature at 42 degrees centigrade. We carry out the redox cycle. One of the things we do use is, is zinc dust to do the reduction followed by nitrothal hexafluorophosphate to carry out the uh, oxidation and all that can be done in 10 minutes. But then we've got to wait an hour and a half for the rings to make their way over the speed bump here. And these high field signals show eventually that this ring is sitting on the collecting chain and we can repeat this process and get two rings on to the collecting chain. So again using a movie you can see that we're moving away from equilibrium as we go down uh, this uh, in this uh, vertical direction. Uh, the first cycle is pretty efficient uh, at 90% overall and what is important on this slide you'll see is this Free energy, energy of activation at 23 kilocalories uh, per mole um, to uh, have the um, ring pass over the speed bump onto the collecting chain. And uh, a little bit less efficient, but nonetheless it happens. Uh, but notice within experimental error, we're getting the same barrier as we got for the first ring. This means that we can put multiple rings over. The presence of rings on collecting chains do not inhibit. Uh, these rings coming to join them uh, in, uh, you will see multiple numbers in a minute. So uh, we increased, increased the efficiency just in terms of the time scale. Uh, you'll see the work was now done at room temperature. Uh, we did some changes to the constitution, very subtle ones. We removed a carbon atom there uh, and that increased the columbic repulsion between this and ultimately the ring when it was on the uh, part here where we're oxidizing and uh, after the redox process it took again an hour and a half to go over uh, onto the collecting chain but if we are to extrapolate up to 42 degrees which I showed you for Mark 1 pump the Mark 2 pump was uh, happening in minutes. So that was a <coughs> increase in speed. And I want to introduce you to 
what I call the molecular joule and Jewett pumps. So the joule pump is really designed so that we're looking forward to a future where uh, we put this into the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, surface of a vesicle uh, and uh, be able to pump uh, rings from outside into the internal part of the vesicle. And so we can uh, take this chemical constitution and uh, starting up here, the ring can be brought on under uh, reduction conditions. Oxidation, we actually are able to um, <coughs> isolate uh, this two rituxane. This is uh, one ring plus the dumbbell, hence, hence the two. And then uh, carry out a reduction and uh, force the ring off the right hand side. So again, it's a unidirectional motion. And here is a movie showing uh, what is happening. And as this goes on, I just want to point out that Yun Yan has just joined uh, NUS as an assistant professor in the last uh, two, three months. Uh, and uh, you see the ring going over to form the turotaxane and then being reduced and oxidized and coming off the end. So we have this uh, prototype, if you like, to be able to have uh, something in put into the uh, uh, surface of a vesicle. <coughs> the Jewett pump is uh, an example where we have uh, these, uh, we now call them pumping cassettes at each end of a linear molecule. This one happens to have 36 methylene groups interacted um, symmetrically by uh, <coughs> positively charged uh, nitrogens with two methyl groups on them. And you can see that in the course of time, we can get uh, four rings on and make a five rituxane. And this we did not using chemicals, but uh, electrochemically with a electric electrolysis set up with uh, these conditions and uh, a period of time when we're reducing and then a period of time when we're oxidizing and we can recycle. Uh, and here is the spectroscopic evidence for the purity of uh, what is a free rotaxin with two rings on the dumbbell. Uh, we can repeat the process as you saw in the movie and get uh, four rings, that is five rotaxin. And again, it's a very well characterized compound. Okay, so we could get up to five and we go larger. And so under the title of a precise polyrituxane synthesizer. Um, this uh, long dumbbell was made. There are many atoms in here. Uh, this unit is repeated 50 times. The number average molecular weight is around about 2,000. Uh, it's fairly homogeneous, not entirely, but fairly good. And that is used uh, to pump on uh, chemically to begin with two rings, four rings, six rings, so that we have a three, five, and seven rituxane that get fully characterized by uh, integration in the uh, proton NMR spectrum. It's, it's very precise. You can see the numbers, uh, for example, 47.45 with the expected 48 there. They're very, very uh, close to what we expect. Um, and again, a movie showing that uh, we can have two rings come on from each side of the uh, long <coughs> polymer chain with its two pumping cassettes. And then we can bring on another two, another two, and I'm going to speed it up so that uh, I leave some time hopefully for questions. Um, and we end up with um, some 12 rings. At this point, we have pushed our luck as far as we can go because of uh, the length of this ring and the massive columbic repulsion that is being built up here. So you have really built up a system that is miles away from uh, equilibrium. Uh, and so with the 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 rings, you amass up to ultimately 48 positive charges. But let's count these two on the end. We can't not might count them. So we have uh, a total of 52 positive charges. And I always throw out a challenge to the community here. If there are battery people, I think we have the makings 
uh, fundamentally of all organic batteries being produced by these uh, compounds. Uh, if we take a higher molecular weight uh, polyethylene glycol chain, then uh, we can uh, push these numbers up further. Uh, here's four rings with five rituxane. Uh, and now we're doing it uh, electrochemically uh, with these conditions here. And uh, here you can see that it's got up to 48 rings with uh, 49 rituxanes. And you can do this in a couple of hours. It's uh, amazingly efficient. And it always comes on one ring from the right and one from the left um, in unison. <coughs> and uh, here you see the um, <coughs> PEG uh, 400, uh, 5000 uh, with a 9 and a 13 uh, rituxane uh, going up uh, eventually with 16 rings, 20 rings to a 17 rituxane and a 21 rituxane. So the take-home messages so far are that uh, we can control the synthesis of polyrituxanes through an autonomous electrochemical approach using artificial molecular pumps. The installment of 20 rings onto a linear peg chain of 5,000 gives us 86 positive charges. And the last one you saw, um, a star polymer, uh, we can get up to... Uh, 20,000 with uh, almost 350 positive charges. So it depends on the efficient operation of what are called these pumping cassettes. And the important concepts are here are that we're dealing with kinetic asymmetry in the context of not in, uh, common or garden thermodynamics, but trajectory thermodynamics. And so what do I mean by these terms? Kinetic asymmetry is an evolving property that allows the selection of a preferred kinetic pathway for determining non-equilibrium behavior. And uh, trajectory thermodynamics is a theory in which the focus is placed on trajectories rather than states when it comes to describing how both biological and artificial molecular machines work when driven by either chemical fuels or electricity. And these trajectory thermodynamics have shed light on how pumping cassettes can be designed to allow the input of energy to drive thermodynamically uphill uh, by pumping rings into a non-equilibrium type system. So, uh, let's go back to our roadmap. Now, we've done all this in solution. Could we put it onto a surface? Yes, we can. So, um, here is a metal organic framework. It's two-dimensional in area. It, uh, I just show the top surface here. Can have grafted onto it these uh, pumps with pumping cassettes at the top. We can easily, for the length of the pumps that we have, uh, put on up to five rings here on the... Uh, various different pumps using these uh, redox uh, reactions that I've described before. And then we can uh, simply dethread by cutting them off at the bottom uh, with some acid because it's a carboxyl group uh, uh, link that we have here to uh, a zirconium-based moth. And under acid uh, sorry, alkaline conditions, you can make the uh, uh, <coughs> various uh, pumps attach themselves to the moth, but as under acidic conditions, you can uh, remove the um, pumps from the metal organic framework. And so here's just an image of going through the uh, start with the base, making the uh, stalks on the two dimensional surface, and then adding these rings until you get up to five, as it turned out in our experiments, and then release them by cutting the um, stalk off at the bottom. Of course, uh, what's on the bottom is uh, here, uh, or what I should say on the top is also on the bottom of this two-dimensional metal organic framework. And so you can go through an even more complicated scenario where you see 
rings coming on from the top and from the bottom. And uh, again, you can remove these very easily at the end of the day. Again, it's a flashing energy ratchet mechanism and it leads to a very important breakthrough in, I think, conceptual science, in surface science. Uh, but before I go there, if we start here, you can see that uh, under um, the first set of conditions, we have uh, brought uh, these rings onto uh, the uh, <coughs> stalks and then uh, we uh, carry out a reduction um, and then an oxidation and during that oxidation process they go over the uh, speed bump in the uh, context of the um, <coughs> stocks on the MOF and then uh, we carry out an oxidation and I go as far as show you that there are two rings on each stock here and uh, we express the uh, uh, accumulation of uh, away from equilibriumness, if you like to call it that, by just using these uh, concentration numbers. So if this is 55 moles per millimoles per litre, this is 111. And so you, every time you're adding on roughly 55 and you're just pushing the energy up and up. <coughs> so what we found exciting about this work is the fact that for about 100 years, the uh, chemistry and physical communities have been uh, well uh, versed in physisorption, uh, somewhat less, maybe uh, 70 years in chemisorption. And now we can add another form of absorption to uh, this list, which we call mechanisorption. And the distinction is that both physisorption with weak van der Waals forces being the driving forces um, and chemisorption where uh, we've got electronic interactions and so they're much stronger. They're both under equilibrium control. But the one that I've been showing you is a non-equilibrium system based on the formation of these mechanical bonds. It's highly selective and it's very easy at the end of the day to uh, go from the very high energy system back to um, a multi-layer that has lost its rings. Okay, so um, physics option, chemis option, and mechanics option. Finally, I want to, as far as um, artificial machines are concerned, mention the um, electric motor that was actually molecular motor published in Nature last week. And uh, it's a simple design. Largely, we took the um, building blocks for the uh, linear molecular pump and built them into a large loop. And so here you can see the um, speed bump. It's the same one as we used in the linear system. Uh, here is the uh, pyridinium charged head. Here are the bipyridinium units. And the familiar, of course, uh, little blue box. And if you uh, start uh, at, uh, redu uh, under reducing conditions, then you can move the ring onto these two bipyridinium, bipyridinium uh, radical cations at, say, 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. If you then, uh, having carried out that reduction, um, and have these two trist radical complexes carry out an oxidation, then the rings move back to um, 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. And you can see that, uh, again, we can use NMR spectroscopy to um, really identify every detail of the structure of this fairly complicated molecule. And uh, we were graced with getting one crystal structure of the reduced state when this uh, reduced uh, ring uh, is on the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock positions. There's our crystal structure. And uh, again, I can show you the right uh, movement uh, around starting up here uh, of these two rings. And uh, you can see them go from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. 
under reduction and in oxidation uh, back eventually to uh, the starting point here except that uh, we're only halfway around. We've only done a 180 degree cycle here uh, by the end of uh, step three and by going on uh, we can complete it in a cyclic way and what I've taken out are we use deuterium labelling to follow um, the fact that the two rings are identical in constitution but if we deuterium labelled one of them we could uh, ascertain that we had a 360 degree rotation after two redox cycles. And so here's a movie um, and uh, you can see the rings under reduction going to 12 and 6 o'clock under oxidation going back to 9 and 3 o'clock. Okay, so uh, how does that compare with what's out there? Uh, David Lee in Manchester, a former student, uh, a few years ago published in Science, a very similar system uh, where uh, he has two rings on a loop, as I would call it, and these were the uh, uh, conclusions from his uh, work. Um, I point out that since it's chemical, there are waste products. Uh, we don't have any waste products because it's powered by electricity. And the time scale of ours is uh, very, very much shorter. What took him a day, we can do in a few seconds uh, electrically. The interesting thing about this publication was that it was, uh, as it were, uh, taken over by the pandemic and so um, the message I mainly want to get out to the young people is because some people say Fraser Stoddart it must be easy for you to publish in nature. No, no, no. Notice it. Four, four years, right? It was an uphill battle uh, and I won't go through the various stages. I will just point out that um, somewhere along the route it went to science and they didn't even put it out for review. Uh, eventually it went to nature and it was accepted. We got the proofs in August but it took them three, four months to publish it. So everything was slow but we got there. So in summarising we have uh, kinetic control of these artificial micro machines. It's all about kinetics, kinetics, kinetics. Uh, the driving force is uh, this radical chemistry that uh, we stumbled across belatedly and uh, the pumping cassettes that uh, take us away from equilibrium are key to getting uh, both this new concept of mechanics option and the electric molecular motor that I've shown you. Now this is not about me, it's about some amazing young scientists. And here are some of the people who were around at the time that we broke into the radical world. And all but two of them are in academia. I don't have time to go through all of them. But uh, Hao Li, for example, since we're close to China, is in Zhejiang University. Uh, uh, Chu Yang Chen in Sichuan. And so it goes on. Han Kai has just gone to that guy. Uh, the work that I described to you with the molecular uh, motors um, was done uh, very much uh, in a collaborative way and I want to add that 95% of my research has been done collaboratively. I enjoy it. It's an enormous uh, opportunity to interact with your colleagues and do things with them that they can do better than you and uh, the eventual uh, outcome is a very, very much better situation than you could do alone. And a great driver in all of this is uh, physicist Dina Stumian up at the University of Maine. There is no one in the world, in my humble opinion, that understands the operation of biomolecular motors and their artificial counterparts better than Dean. And we've been privileged to have uh, a huge amount of uh, Zoom time with them during the pandemic. 
uh, the radical scientists of now are there. As I said, Yunyan has just gone to uh, Singapore. Qinghui is at Zhejiang University along with Hong Lang. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chaoyang Chen is going to Hong Kong University and Yang Zhao is on his way to Peking. And that's what gives me, I think, more satisfaction in the research, the success of these young people tackling not easy problems, but rather tackling problems because they're difficult. Outside my own group, of course, there are the two fellow Nobel laureates, Jean-Pierre Sauvage and Ben Feringa, and uh, we have very friendly uh, interactions and have done over decades with these two incredibly talented uh, scientists. Uh, others that uh, we've worked with or been close to are included there. Very dangerous slide because, and that's why I move it off quickly, someday we'll be sitting out there saying, why is my name not up there? Well, there's only a particular uh, amount of space. Uh, other uh, general comments I want to make is that of late, well, from 2015 through to just a month ago, uh, all of these people that are pictured there have made their comments about the progress of the uh, design and synthesis of uh, molecular machinery in various different uh, journals. Most recently, Carson Bruns in Nature Nanotechnology. Okay, so does this eight minutes mean that uh, I should dry up uh, Yan Li or can I take more? Two minutes? Okay. So as I said, I just want to make the point that my life is not all about molecular machines. It's a small part of our activity. So here's just an example of a bit of breaking news. In 2010, we were visited by serendipity. Here is something called gamma cyclodextrin. Eight glucoses joined up in a circle, if you like. You take a spoonful of sugar. You take a pinch of salt. You take a swig of alcohol. And in British parlance, Bob's your uncle. You've got it. You get this extended CD MOF framework. And uh, this has led to a startup company in, of all areas, skin care. And it was launched just before the onset of the pandemic. And it's going extremely well. That's all I will say. Uh, but this summer, I lectured at the Chirality meeting in uh, Chicago. And I met up with Daniel Armstrong from the University of Texas at Arlington. And uh, in contrast with the cyclodextrins, he told me that uh, microbiologically, he could make cyclic fructans. And he showed me the structure. And I couldn't look at those without seeing a crown either type uh, constitution in the middle there. And so I said, why don't you send us some? And he sent us some. And Yong Wu from Peking University, amazing carbohydrate chemist. Uh, he's made uh, polysaccharides with over 180 residues in them for his PhD. He took this, a spoonful of sugar, CF6 this time, a pinch of salt and a swig of alcohol, and lo and behold, he gets CV, CF, sorry, moths. And so they're assembled just like the cyclodextrin ones. And so we now have two, and there are only two of these metal organic frameworks in the world that are genuinely green, edible, whatever other adjective you want to put onto them, because most of the rest, as you know, are laced with transition metals. And it is the spheres that represent the uh, <coughs> void space that are important in giving these CD MOFs their character 
to store small molecules and now we can anticipate the same scenario for CF MOFs. A couple of uh, slides just talking about philosophy because he's a fellow Scot. Alexander Graham Bell, notice what he had to say uh, if you visit the former Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. Leave the beaten track occasionally and dive into the woods. You will be certain to find something that you've never seen before. My own take on it is head out as a young person if you possibly can and do your own thing because to achieve something that is impactful in contemporary science and to be singled out as a scientist who leaves their mark on science and ultimately technologies, you need to become recognised widely as having done your own thing. This goal means that you make, and this is very important, a conscious decision to sum up enough courage to tackle what I would call a big problem for which no one has provided a satisfactory answer. Conclusion, tackle big problems and be driven by curiosity and almost nothing else. Thank you. Dr. Werner, sorry, don't you like to sew that? Professor Tao will be moderating the Q&A now. Unfortunately, as we're running a bit short on time, we only have time for two questions. Uh, do keep it short so that we can wrap up in time for the small group sessions as well. Professor Tao, please. Yeah, uh, highly inspiring talk by Fraser uh, regarding molecular machine and the switches. Any questions? We only have time for two very short questions. Yes, please. Molecular motors are, of course, fundamentally very interesting. And you have been going for the smaller system to the larger system now. So where do you aim or where do you think is the ultimate goal, going from smaller motors now to the larger systems? Uh, where do you think uh, are you actually heading to? Like, what is the ultimate application could be for this kind of large systems? To be very honest, I don't give a damn about applications. <laughs> I am effectively driven scientifically by addressing fundamental issues. There's far too much out there in the media about what are the applications. And I'm sick and tired of uh, over several decades dealing with uh, the media on this subject. And I always end up by saying, I'm a professor. The output from my laboratory is not necessarily micro machines or CD MOFs or CF MOFs. It is young people that go on in their own environments to be incredibly creative because I've spent and enjoyed spending so much time with people roughly aged between 18 and 32. That is my main output. I look back on it. It's much more important than what are the applications. And nowadays, I don't drive the research program. The young people drive it. I'm in Singapore. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, thank you for this insightful talk. So as, a, as a biophysicist, I've always been fascinated by, let's say, biomolecular motors, the ones that move in cells and, let's say, transport vesicles across microtubules. So um, do you see possibilities for the, the electric mo molecular motors that you've shown to, let's say, put external load on them and make them, let's say, transport things? Of course. I think, um, you know, this is just like um, the birds and the bees and the bats, they have been flying around for millennia. It's only in the last, what, 120 years, if we go back to the Wright brothers. And let me just interject that fellow Scott physicist, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, towards the end of his life said there would never be manned flight. Ha, 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 he got it so wrong. Um, and so again, it's very difficult to predict. I'm not going to say 
they are going to have the same impact uh, if we take the electric motor at the molecular level that the electric motor is having at the macroscopic level today. We've gone through the um, time of the food mixers and the um, uh, hair dryers and now we have electric vehicles on the road and so on and so forth. But you know, it's this taken two centuries for that to happen because the first steps were taken uh, by a few physicists in the 1830s, 1820s, 1830s. And it did in fact take half a century before the first uh, hair dryers and uh, food mixers came on the scene, let alone electric vehicles. So I don't know how many decades it's going to take, but I predict that one day, both in material science, and I'll leave that just with these two words, but in medical science, there will be a revolution that will be akin to uh, the way people have hip joint replacements. And I've just had a heart valve replacement, a so-called TAVR in the last 18 months. These are amazing things that are happening at a macroscopic level and they don't get the um, publicity that, uh, oh, we're gonna solve the problem of cancer. Ah, oh, come on, you're not. That's a big, big, big problem and it's gonna take a long time. But the medical profession have made great advances in replacing joints and hearts and all the rest of it. So it's just a matter of time before I think they look to uh, these artificial molecular motors to perhaps aid in a bet the performance of uh, the biological ones. But there's a lot of development to go on there, a lot of dreaming and a lot of uh, challenge. Okay, thank you, looking forward. Yeah. All right, uh, please feel free to discuss this further during break. Thank you so much. I also want to thank Frieza again for his uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you again, professors. Thank you.